looks like we have some of our participants on, and I think we're going to get started. So, everyone to the Neighborhood Health Series. We're very excited to be back. Um, obviously, we had some events scheduled in the spring that were canceled due to COVID, and, um, and then we were able to provide a virtual Neighborhood Health Series on the topic of COVID. And then we had our summer hiatus, so we're very happy to be back with you, and certainly we miss seeing you in person, um, but we hope that you've been safe and healthy, and we're very much looking forward to getting started back. Um, please note the upcoming schedule is on the Neighborhood Health Series website that we have planned out throughout the rest of this year as well as next year. And we'll make a decision probably in December of this year as to whether or not we can offer um, this series in person in the new year. So we're hopeful that we can. So thank you all for being here today. Um, a warm thank you to Clark County Credit Union, specifically Craig Fraley, for sponsoring this series. Um, their sponsorship allows this event to happen. Um, it, it helps to um, provide for the dinner that we provide everyone, and ultimately any um, residual funds that are left over go directly to student scholarships. So we're very proud um, to have them as one of our partners. And with that, um, I'd like to quickly tell you a little bit about our presenter today. Dr. Martin Lipsky has worked in higher education for more than 25 years, including 10 years as the Dean of University of Illinois College of Medicine at Rockford. Prior to that, he served as founding chair for the Department of Family Medicine at Northwest, Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago and Evanston Northwestern Healthcare in Evanston as well, and as the Assistant Dean for Generalism at the Medical College of Pennsylvania, Hanneman University School of Medicine in Philadelphia. After obtaining his medical degree from the Medical College of Pennsylvania, he completed his residency at the UC, at University of California at Irvine Medical Center, and then completed his fellowship in academic primary care medicine at Michigan State University. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry and a Master of Science in Bioorganic Chemistry from Loyola Marymount University at Los, Los Angeles and University of California at Santa Barbara, respectively. He began career as a staff physician at the Fraser Mountain Community Health Center in Fraser, California, and has served as medical director and program director for a variety of hospitals and residency programs in California and Ohio. During his time at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine, he received the Dean's Distinguished Service Award and was recognized as one of the best primary care doctors in the United States by Town & Country Magazine. He also received a President's Achievement Award from Evanston Northwestern Healthcare. Dr. Lipsky has served as a member and leader of several committees and boards, including the National Kidney Foundation and Illinois Center of Excellence in Behavioral Health and Justice. His scholarly activities include health, medical education, and primary care. He is former editor-in-chief of Journal of Clinical Outcomes Management and is currently on the editorial boards of Education for Health, Journal of Rural Health, and Disease a Month. He has more than 150 articles and book chapters and edited five books, including Blueprints in Family Medicine and the AMA Home Health Care Encyclopedia. Dr. Lipsky served as our chancellor of Roseman University's South Jordan campus from 2015 to 2019. In 2019, Dr. Lipsky retired with the goal of spending more time with his wife and more time on the trails in Oregon. Dr. Lipsky currently serves as adjunct faculty for the University College of Dental Medicine as well as adjunct faculty for Portland State University. Please welcome Martin Lipsky. Hey, well, thank you very much. And I also want to acknowledge our sponsor, Craig uh, Frilly. Thank you for that uh, kind um, introduction, Vanessa. Uh, it makes me feel like my mother wrote it. And I usually tell a little story to put some of this in perspective. So Vanessa was kind enough to um, note that I edited five books. And I still remember how excited I was uh, when the first book came out. And I went to a conference and somebody said, well, you know, you can go on Amazon and you can see how well your book is selling. So I couldn't wait till I got home from the conference. I got to computer and I clicked on Amazon and I found out I was like the 2,757,000th bestseller in the United States that year. I didn't even know that they, that they had that many books. Now it's interesting as I bought, uh, 10 copies for my parents and friends, and I jumped up another 400,000 uh, places. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk about hip replacements from two perspectives. One is as a doctor 
and uh, one is his patient. And one caveat is I'm a primary care physician and so uh, not an orthopedist. So uh, for really arcane questions about the actual surgery, I might have trouble answering. And truth be told, I'm not sure I was the best uh, uh, patient either. And so what we're gonna cover today is, uh, here's the roadmap. We'll go through uh, what osteoarthritis is, who gets it, different things. And throughout this, I will try to uh, weave in my story and some of the things that uh, uh, happened to me as uh, part of this talk from my perspective. So first, what is um, osteoarthritis? And it comes from the um, uh, Latin word root, osteo meaning bone and arthritis meaning inflammation of the joint. And frequently you hear people talk about uh, wear and tear arthritis. Um, and this is what they mean when they say wear and tear arthritis. Another term sometimes is you hear that it's also called degenerative arthritis. One of the misconceptions is people think of this as being a disease of the bone. And what it actually is, it's a disease of the uh, cartilage. And what cartilage is, is if you're ever eating a, a, a bad steak and you got a lot of that white gristly stuff in it, that's actually cartilage. And what cartilage does to the joint, it's a very smooth white substance that helps allow the joint to move smoothly uh, through all its uh, different motions, as well as uh, cushioning uh, the joint. It forms as a, basically as a little shock absorber. Uh, next slide. And so what happens is that um, in osteoarthritis, the uh, cartilage starts to break uh, down. One slide after that, uh, I think, there you go. Uh, so that cartilage actually starts to break down. And what happens is that creates a whole cascade of events that um, uh, damage the joint. So, and so if you have a joint that's pressing up against its bone like that, normally the cartilage is kind of cushions it like a sponge. And as that begins to erode or be damaged, it actually then puts pressure on that bone. And that pressure on the bone triggers a whole cascade of inflammatory events. One thing it does is there's something called the synovium, and that's the lining around the joint. And what that does is that makes kind of the oil fluid that keeps the joint nice and uh, smooth and uh, uh, moving uh, smoothly. And so that gets damaged. And then that kind of creates a vicious feedback cycle where the ligaments inside the joint, those are the tissues that uh, hold the bones together so they don't wobble outside the joint or dislocate. And then that causes pain, it causes restriction of motion. So then you don't move the joint as much, your muscles weaken, and it creates a vicious uh, feedback uh, cycle. Next slide. So very, very common. Who gets this? Well, it's pretty much older adults. It's much less common in those under age 50, but it occurs, particularly those who may have uh, risk factors. And the bad news is if you, uh, as you age, once you get to 65, almost everyone, 80% plus, have some evidence of uh, damage to their joints or osteoarthritis if you started doing x-rays in these individuals. Um, what's very interesting is, well, if you have pain, you usually have some evidence uh, that there's a problem on the x-ray, but it's really bizarre. Um, sometimes people have these x-rays that look horrible, and you think, how can that person even walk? And they're hardly bothered by it. And in some other cases, what happens is um, people have these very, very minor changes and seems to cause them a lot of pain. So there really isn't a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation. And in fact, um, I probably knew I was first in trouble when I had an x-ray and the tech came out and he says, hey doc, you really got some arthritis in that hip. So I knew I was in trouble once the x-ray tech could uh, wear it, uh, read it. So a couple other things. It, does seem to have a slight familial tendency, and it's more common in women. I think of my own family where my mother had bad arthritis of her fingers, uh, getting a little bit of a deviation, and then my sister developed the same thing. But certainly it's very common, crosses all levels of people, men, women, different ages, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, hip surgeries become 
one of the most common surgeries. There's over 300,000 hip replacement surgeries in the United States. Um, next slide. Hey, there's two major uh, types of arthritis, and by far the most common is primary or idiopathic. And by idiopathic, it sort of means we shrug our shoulders and we have no idea exactly what causes it. Or as I say, sometimes using fancy Latin words like idiopathic allow physicians to charge uh, more money. This kind of arthritis is the wear and tear one. And so it usually affects joints you use a lot or weight bearing joints like your uh, uh, hips or knees. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, risk factors, but among the uh, most common risk factor, unfortunately, in our country is being overweight. And if you think about sort of your knee and your hip and that you lose some of the cushion, the more you weigh, the more stress it puts on that joint. Very rarely you see what we call secondary, which means you have the same changes of osteoarthritis, but it is due to some underlying cause. And one of the most common causes is trauma. So if you think about uh, uh, people that play football and all the repetitive uh, problems that they have and all the hits they get from uh, 300 pound linemen uh, hitting against one another, that repetitive uh, trauma is, uh, uh, sometimes leads to um, osteoarthritis. And so again, I said most of it, uh, we have no idea what happens. We do know some things that contribute to it. To it. Increasing age, being overweight, and joint injury. And then there's other factors. Sometimes people are born with a little bit of deformity of their joints. The angle isn't exactly uh, normal, so it puts more stress on the joints. Or some people will be born with a leg discrepancy. In, in my case, I try and think back and my left hip was so much worse than my right hip. I kept thinking, why could that be? One reason I think is um, I had a knee injury on my right knee. And whenever I would play sports or anything, I would always favor my left leg and my left hip. And so again, I have no way of knowing, but I think it was that extra um, uh, stress that um, uh, played a role. And so this is kind of a nice slide that shows a Venn diagram, uh, next slide, uh, Vanessa, shows a Venn diagram with all the risk factors coming together. So you have some susceptibility. It runs in families. Uh, it's more common in women, uh, people that are overweight. Some people have different bone densities. And then you look at mechanical factors that can play a role. You put aging in it. And those are kind of the constellations of things that come together that causes um, osteoarthritis. Okay, I'm now gonna focus mainly on hips, but a lot of what I will say is related to um, uh, knees and other joints. So the first thing is the hip is a big joint, one of the largest in our body gets a lot of weight. And it's basically a ball and socket. What that means is if you look at my fist, that's the end of your thigh bone or femur, and it fits into part of your pelvis called the acetabulum, acetabulum, and then it kind of rotates like that. So it's a ball and socket joint. And um, uh, the cartilage, remember, is what makes it move nice and smoothly, as well as cushion when you uh, put uh, uh, weight on it. Uh, next slide. And so this is a, a basically a um, diagram of a normal hip and an abnormal hip. So if you look at the normal hip, and I think Vanessa is gonna uh, possibly even do, if need be, be my arrow uh, maker. We, we practiced this earlier, and so hopefully this works. So on the good hip, you can see where there is the uh, nice smooth lining. You can see how it fits in the socket. And on the other side, you can see how it gets damaged. Instead of that nice rim of cartilage, it's degenerated and it's kind of gotten flatter and more damaged. And as a result, that has triggered some inflammatory changes in the bone and you can see how bumpy they look. And those little extra bone growths, those are what we refer to as bone spurs. So you hear that a lot of times. I had a bone spur on my ankle, I had a bone spur in my hip. Um, it's because the abnormal pressures and stresses 
put on the bone trigger those changes. Next slide. And this is, and Vanessa assured me this would not gross people out. This is actually a pathological specimen that they've taken hips removed from people. And you can see, um, I'm not gonna tell you which because if I've done a good job, you can probably tell which is the worst hip. So they're both diseased hip, but you can see the surface of that little protuberance, that is the cartilage. And on one, you can see it's really pretty smooth. There's a little bit of irregularity. And on the other side, you can see how raggedy and junky it looks. Okay, Vanessa, you can show them which one is the bad one and which is the good one. Did our, is our pointer gonna work? Yeah, we're having a little, a little bit of problems with that. Well, we'll keep moving on then. So the big question is, how do we diagnose uh, this? And um, there is no simple answer. There's no single test, nothing that you can do that suddenly says you have osteoarthritis. Instead, it's a combination of symptoms, it's the exam, and imaging. And by imaging, we need x-rays or CT scans. And one of the things is that you'll frequently, I had blood tests drawn when I saw my doctor about my hip, and the blood tests are not to help them diagnose the osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease, but rather it helps to exclude other secondary causes that might affect treatment. So for example, if I have some metabolic problem that is damaging the joint or my bones, we would want to address that and treat that differently than if it was um, osteoarthritis. And probably the biggest um, secondary diagnosis that you see is rheumatoid arthritis. And yes, you sometimes will still do some of the same treatments, but there's also other treatments that you would do that would be different. So again, what are the symptoms? And by far, the most common symptom is some type of pain. And kind of it's usual, you know, it's gradual, intermittent. Sometimes you go in, God, I think I walked a little too much. And it's more prominent with uh, weight bearing. And usually it's relieved by rest. So for example, uh, when I was getting into a, uh, more of the pain type symptoms, if I rested for 10 or 15 minutes, it made all the difference in the world. And I was lucky. I almost never had any discomfort at rest other than if I had done a lot of activity during the day. And I really never had pain that kept me up at night. But you can begin to see that as it progresses, you go from intermittent pain, day pain, and then it starts keeping you up at night. And the pain is there's no specific pain. It can be sharp, it can be dull, it can be diffuse. Mine was kind of dull and achy. In fact, when I complained of my uh, hip maybe having a problem initially to my primary care physician, he thought it was uh, my back because I, because I kind of pointed hurting in my back a little bit. And he said, I'll do the x-ray anyway. And then when I was a physician, I would get fooled sometimes because people would pay complain of thigh or groin pain. And I really didn't connect it to um, uh, hip arthritis. And I remember a couple of times sent in to an, uh, a surgeon and you know, surgeons will do what they'll do. And the surgeon came back and said, ah, I'm gonna replace the pain, hip. That's gonna make all the difference in the world. I have to admit, I was a little skeptical, but darn, it really did seem to work. So the pain sometimes is really hard to pin uh, down. Now, the next symptom is movement. And this is, this is kind of was the big problem in some ways for me. I still remember the first time that um, I realized something was uh, wrong. So we went to a destination wedding in Cancun, which by the way, I learned is a way of shifting expenses from the people who are getting married to the people who are attending. I'm sorry, but that's how it seems to work. And we were staying at this really nice resort. And of course, they had free bikes and I being one never to miss a free opportunity decided with my wife, we're going to go ride some bikes. So we go over, we get the bikes and I go, I'm having trouble swinging my leg over the bike to get on. And that was the first time I go, darn, something seems to be going on here. And I have to admit, I was at the much tender age than in my early 50s. So I was shocked. I was thinking, how can this happen to me? And then for me, uh, one of the things is that usually 
um, it gets stiffer with inactivity. And so things that would help me is if we were gonna go for a walk, I never like to get up right after breakfast and go. I kind of wanted to move around or I said, I need my warm up time. And we went on a, a hiking trip in the Mount Hood area and um, everybody wanted to get up at 6.30 and immediately hit the trail. And I, it used to take me about 15 minutes to catch up because I needed that warm up time. Restricted range of motion was a big one for me. And I'll talk about when you know how to time surgery, but my aha moment was when I could no longer easily put on my socks. When I'd go to the gym and the hardest part of the workout was trying to get my socks on after the workout and after I took a shower, I kind of had to get socks those days that had kind of wide openings because I kind of throw them over and kind of point my toe because I couldn't bend enough to cross my legs to put the sock on. And so for me, it was a very restricted range of motion. I never fully appreciated limp, which is a common uh, uh, problem, but my friends sure did. They'd call me hop along or um, I had so many people say, hey, you ever think of getting that hip replaced? So for me, while it didn't bother me, everybody around me was troubled by uh, a limp. And then sometimes what happens because it's painful and you don't uh, walk as much, you'll either get muscle spasm or you'll begin to get <coughs> weakness from uh, the muscles. Next uh, slide. Hey, so one of the um, kind of sad facts about medicine is examination actually is never quite as helpful as one would think it is. In some ways, what happens is it helps you confirm the diagnosis you make by talking uh, to someone. And so what a doctor will look for is a look for tenderness. And then sometimes there's lots of things that can cause hip pain. You can have bursitis, you can have tendonitis, you can have a pulled muscle. Um, and so they're sometimes looking for uh, something else that might be uh, causing the pain. They'll do range of motion. And in my case, that's uh, one of the big things uh, that um, uh, the doctor did. I kind of lay, you lay on your back and they kind of twist and rotate your hip internally and externally. And both sides actually had restricted motion, but the other one, he could uh, hardly move it. And I'll show you an x-ray later on why that was the case. Um, what they do sometimes is they'll move your hip passively where they lift it versus actively. Sometimes you use that to determine whether the pain is in the hip or in the muscle or soft tissue. Um, but the main things you're looking for is it something else and um, uh, to kind of confirm your thought uh, process. Next slide. So probably the one test that uh, pretty much you do need is a uh, x-ray. And sometimes you may not see much of anything. And remember, it's a disease of the cartilage. Cartilage can't be seen on the, uh, on the x-ray. But think of it this way. Uh, remember, ball and socket, okay? And that open space is my uh, cartilage. Does not show up on x-ray. So it looks like a big, dark space there. But if it starts to get compressed and damaged, what happens is I lose that cushioning sponge and it gets closer and closer and the joint starts to narrow. And remember that then triggers more pressure on the bone and all sorts of uh, changes. And so sometimes you can see those bone spurs. Once in a blue moon, <coughs> you will need an advanced study like a bone scan or a CT. Maybe you're confused if it's an infection or what, but generally a plain x-ray is good enough. And as a remember, um, lab testing is usually very, very normal in osteoarthritis. You're looking to rule out other causes. Next slide. Okay. And get your pointer ready. Here, oh, you got, hey, you could, you can go to the second year of medical school. You're already going on the right thing. So the normal one, there's actually a nice little thing that says uh, uh, joint space. So again, what's filling that area is the cartilage, which you don't see. And you can see how how nice and smooth the bones look. Let's look on the other side and you see two things. First, what happens, I don't see any joint space at all. It's almost obliterated because the cartilage is gone. If you look at the two bones, the one that's on the disease looks a lot wider, which means it's grown more bone. And the reason for that is, uh, and we call that sclerosis, 
what happens is that pressure now that's on that bone starts to say, I need to be stronger and grow more bone. And so you see that sign. And then there's a little thing that's a bone spur and you don't see that on the other x-ray. And that, that was my problem. I had this huge bone spur. And so what happened is it couldn't turn in the joint because the bone spur just blocked the turn. And so that's when um, there's nothing that you can give medically that cures that. You just have to decide if you want to operate. Okay, next slide. Okay, so treatment strategies. Um, you'll notice I put surgery on the very bottom because I view that as a last resort. And I was a pretty uh, nihilistic uh, uh, physician when I practiced in that I did not like to send people to surgery. So I really want a clear cut um, uh, need for surgery. So let's talk about all these other options that you have. So first we'll focus on education. And education for a primary care physician, you can advance one slide. Uh, education for a primary care physician is very, very important. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna uh, make sure the person understands what the disease and is and isn't. And then you want to discuss joint protection. And uh, for the most part, not a big player for hip, but certainly uh, for knees, like you sometimes put knee braces on different things or splints when it's a uh, joint is painful to kind of protect it and let the infl uh, inflammation die down. Um, you talk about um, uh, obesity, or sometimes um, I used to think you're a little too short for your weight. And so you have a couple options. You're not going to grow taller. So you have to try and lose weight. Losing weight is very, very, very hard work. And it's very, um, most people are unable to accomplish it. I think of two things to think about. First is, usually people are gaining a pound or two every year after they turn age 40. And so if nothing else, you try and encourage people to say, Let's pick a weight and stabilize on this. And weight maintenance is a lot easier than weight loss. The second thing <clears throat> is there's good and bad news. Yes, weight loss is very hard, but sometimes surprisingly modest amounts of weight loss, as little as 10 pounds, sometimes make a big difference. And um, it's important to encourage exercise. I'm going to spend a little bit more time about that. And then you begin to review treatment options. Next slide. Okay, so one of the education um, uh, things or you tell people is you really can't wear out your joint. It, and as long as you avoid painful exercise, um, high impact exercise, exercise is probably uh, good for you. And I encourage if any of you suffer from uh, arthritis, you kind of use some common sense. What you want to do are avoid things that are painful. And um, there's a difference between pain and soreness. Uh, pain means, oh, ouch, ouch. Soreness means, ah, uh, it hurts a little bit. Maybe I pop a Tylenol, I'm okay. So what you wanna do is avoid things that actually cause pain. And then to try and avoid some of the potential problems of high impact, things like jogging or contact sports, things like swimming, walking, or cycling, which encourages range of motion are good things. Surprisingly, exercise may even be good to, uh, uh, to, uh, for cartilage nutrition. And one of the things about cartilage is it, there's really no blood vessels in cartilage. So it's nourished by the synovial fluid or the joint fluid that it bathes in. And if you uh, exercise a bit, you actually increase that circulation and may actually help the cartilage uh, be healthier. And while cartilage really doesn't truly repair itself, it can maybe repair itself a little uh, tiny bit. The other things is if you keep your muscle strong, it takes some of the stress out of the joint and it would be, I'd be remiss in saying that exercise is good for other reasons. It's good psychologically and it's good for your overall uh, health. Um, next one, I'll talk just briefly about this because for hips, mobility aids are usually not all, a, a ton. The, Two biggest ones are probably uh, canes and walkers. And, um, and then at rare occasions, sometimes special soles or insoles. So for example, um, 
my feet turn in a little bit. And so by having a, a, a I just bought one of those 7.99 uh, inserts, it kind of turned my foot out a little bit and actually it helped my hip for a little bit. Not a ton, but it helped a little bit. And then again, there's sprints and blade, the braces. Those are more for other joints. And then aids, um, sometimes helping to put on shoes. And who would have believed it? I actually had to buy one of those darn little things that you use to put your socks on. Uh, that's kind of new when I was uh, hitting the end of the line. The second thing is, uh, particularly um, if you have trouble reaching or bending over, there's again, um, uh, adaptations or graspers that you can use to help with uh, that. Uh, now, physical therapy, I actually have sent tons of people to physical therapy in my career. And I got to tell you, until actually I went to see the physical therapist after my surgery, I began to appreciate, hey, these guys really have an expertise and add things uh, to your care that uh, were very, very helpful. So sometimes I wonder if it might not have been helpful for me to have seen physical therapy. And some of the things that they do is they give you exercise that helps with that range of motion, flexibility. Um, and then if you're getting some weakened muscles that are stressing the joints or have some imbalance in your strength, they'll sometimes design a exercise program that tailors to your individual uh, needs. And then, Canes and walkers, there's a little bit of a learning curve to make sure that you use them uh, properly. So for example, the biggest mistake that I always see uh, uh, people do is they put the cane on the side of their bad hip and actually you're supposed to put it on the side of your good hip. And the reason is that cane ever slips away or something, all your weight stays on your good hip. Whereas if it slips away, and it's you're on your bad hip side, it hurts your bad hip. So there's some nuances about making sure you get the right angle of the uh, elbow, that they fit it right, that they instruct it, that you know how to go upstairs, that physical therapy is very helpful for. Um, for medicine, uh, there's really uh, no cure. Uh, all you're trying to do is control the symptoms and simple analgesics are usually the first line and your best choice of medicines. If most people view acetaminophen or Tylenol as the first choice, and it's because of its safety profile. The maximum dose is four grams a day, but this is important. Remember, I said uh, people with osteoarthritis tend to be older, and you need to reduce the dose in older individuals to three grams. And then you have to be a little bit tricky. It, it can be a little tricky because other medicines that you don't think of as having Tylenol in it, like cold medicines might. And so you have to be careful, you stay under that three gram limit. And then if you happen to have liver disease, you should avoid it um, and you should limit uh, alcohol when you're taking the medication. Next slide. Probably the medicine that everybody thinks about is uh, things that we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Again, uh, you might hear them called NSAIDs. It's usually how we uh, refer to them, that's the acronym. And probably the one that people are most familiar with is ibuprofen. One company that makes it, its trade name is Motrin. Another, it's Advil. Um, and the two that are available over the counter are ibuprofen and naproxen. And you can get them prescription. It's the exact same drug, just in higher dose. And then there's a whole slew of other ones that you can get by prescription. I listed uh, some of them. And how these work is that your body, when there's inflammation, um, releases a chemical called prostaglandin. And that just creates a cycle that creates more inflammation and damage. And what these do is they cut off your body's ability to um, uh, make prostaglandin. So one of the things is everybody thinks of these as harmless medications. They are among the most hazardous medications out there, even though they're over the counter. And they are probably the leading cause of drug-induced hospitalizations in this country. And some of the problems is they cause stomach pain, stomach bleeding, they increase your blood pressure, they increase your risk of heart attacks, they can damage your uh, kidneys. 
there was a pharmacist who created a list, his name was Mark Bears, and he created a list of drugs that you should avoid in older adults. By the way, I um, define older adults as anyone 10 years older than I am. I'm beginning to have to shift that to frail elderly or now people 10 years older than I am. But really, these are potentially hazardous medicines. If you take them with food, cuts down a little bit on the stomach side effects. And I usually think of these as an adjunct medicine where you take them on really bad days and you take them as needed. They are synergistic with uh, acetaminophen. That is because they have different mechanism of actions that when you take pain relief from uh, Tylenol, pain relief from Motrin, and you take them together, you actually get enhanced pain relief. And in fact, there are a lot of studies from the dental literature that show when you combine uh, acetaminophen and NSAID together, they're as good as your superior to opioids for uh, pain relief. And one of the things is that they're all equally effective, although some may be more effective in one individual than another. And so if somebody says Motrin doesn't work, you usually try another type of NSAID that's from a, a different chemical class and see if that would work. Uh, next slide. Um, so you probably have also heard of something called COX-2 inhibitors. And these are also NSAIDs. They, they have the same effect. They relieve pain and inflammation. But the difference is when you look at the enzymes that form the pathway to make prostaglandins, um, there's two types of, there's two enzymes. And the traditional enzymes uh, or traditional NSAIDs block both enzymes. But the, these, these COX-2 inhibitors block only the COX-2 enzyme. What is the difference is, well, you know, some prostaglandins look like they're good and some prostaglandins actually help protect the stomach and line the stomach and protect against stomach acid. And so the feeling is that the COX-2 inhibitors uh, reduce the incidence of stomach bleeding and stomach upset. And they, and they do. It's not zero, but they do. There's only one on the market now called Celebrex. There used to be an older one called Biax, which um, anecdotally, people swore by it. I had people when it was going off the market and they'd say, Dr. Lipsky, can you write me 500 Biax? I gotta store this stuff up. It's the only thing that allows me to live. Biax is on the market in other countries, but it's no longer on, on the market in this country. And the reason was because of its problems with heart disease and kidney failure. They are more expensive medications. And so many insurance companies won't allow you to prescribe a COX-2 inhibit, inhibitor as your first medication. They wanna see if you have a problem with a COX-1 or if you fall into a special class, somebody who's over 65, somebody who's on some uh, medication like aspirin that might make you uh, prone to bleeding or has a history of GI problems. Next slide. Narcotics. Um, uh, no, it's the only thing I really underlined in this whole talk, and that is they have a limited role in osteoarthritis. Narcotics are wonderful for certain things. They are horrible for chronic pain. And the reason is they're habit forming, dose escalation, and I think they're helpful if somebody has it like a fractured bone and is acutely hurt, but they have really no role in osteoarthritis. The other drug I'll mention is steroids. While you can take them by mouth, the main use for uh, uh, treatment in osteoarthritis or um, like knee or hip is to, as a joint injection, we inject a small amount of steroid directly into the joint to stem uh, the inflammation. Next slide. Um, now, topical treatments are interesting. I never really uh, use these very much, but there's several on the market. They work many different ways. And kind of to cut to the chase, are they effective? Very mixed opinions. Some people say they're very helpful. Other people say they're no. I think it's very individual. And my feeling is they're probably worth a try because for the most part, they're safer than uh uh, pills. And if they work for you, great. And the one that um, I like is uh, capsaicin or Zostrix. Um, that has the same ingredient that is in uh, pepper. And what it does is it tricks your nerves a little bit. 
it burns the skin and so your nerves begin to be tricked and think that there's a little bit of burning and they focus less on the hip. And then again, uh, some of them have some of the anti-inflammatory medicines. Um, I think if you're in pain, worth a try. Next slide, please. So other treatments I'm gonna mention are um, a couple that I a lot of people buy over the counter. They're considered a supplement and they're glucosamine and chondroitin. And the rationale behind these, remember disease of the cartilage, these are two chemicals that are building blocks for cartilage. And the idea is if you give the body more building blocks, it's helpful to build the structure of the cartilage. Um, and you notice the source I said was NCAM. Uh, that's put out by the NIH. And whenever I have a question about a supplement or a mineral or herbal medicine, that is my go-to source because they synthesize a lot of the information very non-judgmental, and they list you know, positives and negatives. And so their conclusion is probably chondroitin is not that helpful, but glucosamine uh, might. And the thing about glucosamine, it's pretty safe. Uh, sometimes you should, you have to let your doctor know because it can affect uh, a blood thinner if you're on it, and it can also affect your blood sugar. But for the most part, it's pretty safe. One thing to note is if you're allergic to shellfish, you shouldn't take this because um, chondroitin is one of the major factors in shellfish. And sometimes the uh, way they manufacture uh, chondroitin is by grinding up shellfish. Next slide. So this is just a little pyramid of how I think about this. You start with education. You talk about teaching. You try uh, medications, you talk about exercise, you look at physical therapy, maybe you do a steroid injection, and then kind of your last resort. I guess it's not the apex because it's uh, inverted. I don't know what you call the bottom of a paragraph, uh, pyramid like that, but the bottom of it is major surgical procedures. So uh, now, uh, next slide. Yes, we're gonna talk about uh, surgery. And you can see um, this is another uh, diagram of a hip that actually now has the uh, artificial joint in. And we'll spend a little bit more time on that. Uh, next slide. Um, so surgical options. One is arthroscopy. I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna cover it. I'm gonna focus on, um, uh, uh, oh, I get a question already. I'm so excited. And I know there's other hip, I know there's uh, people in the audience who may know more about some of this uh, than I do, as well as I just saw one uh, from someone who we've shared a lot of hip stories together. Okay, I'm not gonna cover arthroscopy. I'm gonna focus on hip replacement. And if Vanessa feels we have a little bit of time left over, I'm gonna cover uh, hip resurgence. And I say, oh my, because that's how I thought. So what are the indications? It's basically when one is ready. And it kind of came together People kept nagging me. My wife's threatened divorce. Um, I, she it was very embarrassing because she'd hike up ahead and have to turn around and come back to get me because I get there, it was just slow. And for me, my aha moment was the whole sock issue. But typically people, like my ortho guy, I thought he was very good. I, he said, uh, you think I'm ready uh, for a, a hip replacement? And his answer, the first visit was, uh, come back when you tell me you're ready. And I said, hey, can I do uh, uh, much more damage to this hip? And he said, no, nah, the way it is now, you can't do much more damage to it. So he educated me and he left it up for me. Next uh, uh, slide, please. And so real quickly, the difference between uh, hip resurfacing is hip resurfacing, you actually just replace the head of that ball, the femur with a nice smooth area and you fix up the socket and it, that's how it works. Hip replacement basically means you're gonna take off part of the hip bone, you're gonna take off part of the damaged area of the, um, of the pelvis bone, and you're gonna replace them entirely. Next slide. Um, so there are a couple different things. So first of all, um, one of the things is I was kept people saying anterior, anterior, uh, replacement, that's what you want. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the differences. So there are two common techniques. One is the anterior, where they go uh, through your thigh 
and one's the, through the posterior where you go through your butt. And so um, in this country right now, and there's a shift, about 70% of the surgeries are done with a posterior approach, 30% um, are anterior. Which is better? There is no consensus. I, to prepare for this talk, I read a ton of articles and, the, and they had a couple in major orthopedic uh, uh, journals where they had two respected surgeons arguing pro and con. And the consensus probably is it depends on the surgeon, whichever one they feel is best for you. And the bottom line is after a year, there apparently is no uh, difference in outcomes and the success for both are good. It's about 92%. And right now I'm about a year out and I'm feeling like I'm in that 92%. And the things that I got was, um, I don't think about putting on my shoes and socks again. I love it. Um, I walk a lot better now. And interestingly enough, my other knee and my back doesn't hurt as much because I think they kind of straightened me out. I think it did improve my quality of life. My wife's in the other room and I almost hate to admit that, but she pushed me, pushed me, pushed me. And as my uh, one other friend said, when are you gonna stop whining and admit this was a good thing? Okay, they're not here. I think I have about 30 witnesses. Yeah, it was a good thing. And the rule of thumb is that these last about 20 years. And it depends a lot, but I also timed it because I thought I just wanna go through one uh, hip replacement and so um, I think I'm probably pretty good because uh, uh, I'm getting old and I don't think, uh, I may not live 20 years anyway. And so I thought I timed it well. Next slide. Okay, so this shows kind of the apparatus. So um, you can see the stem that's gonna go inside the hip bone. And then what they do is they kind of ream out your pelvis and they put that metal thing in place and secure it. And then they put a smooth plastic cup that the two articulate against. Next slide. And this is basically showing a healthy hip, arthritic hip, and a total hip. So you have a nice healthy hip. The middle one, you begin to see those bones first, those ugly things. And what they do is they cut off the diseased part of the uh, bone. They pound that little stem into your uh, femur, and then they uh, usually attach, sometimes with a screw or bone glue, the cup and the liner to your hip, and that's what the artificial hip looks like. Next one. And this is just a little bit better uh, picture that's showing it with uh, uh, an artist drawing it with a uh, real bone. Next one. And this is how it looks at x-ray. You can see um, on the A, you can see the diseased hip, and you see a lot of things that we're talking about, uh, that extra whiteness in the bone compared to the other side. There's no uh, joint space. And then when you take an x-ray, um, that's what it looks like with the actual hip replacement. And the answer is yes, you let people know at TSA that you have the uh, hip um, replacement and they'll put you through the special one or they patch you down. Um, now, the next one, um, this is a one and a half minute video, but I think it's a pretty good demonstration of what I've been talking about. So do you think you can actually make this work? We're gonna try. Okay, I hope there isn't too many god-awful advertisements in it. Is it thinking? Okay, all right. Total hip replacement. During this procedure, your damaged hip joint is replaced with implants that recreate the ball and socket of a healthy hip. This can reduce pain and restore your hip function. In preparation for the procedure, you are anesthetized. The surgeon creates an incision to expose your hip joint. The damaged head of your femur is removed. The surgeon carefully removes damaged cartilage and bone from your hip socket. A metal socket is placed into the cavity. Bone cement or screws may secure it in place. The surgeon presses a liner into the socket. 
the liner creates a smooth surface that will allow the joint to move freely. The surgeon now focuses on the femur implant. First, the end of the femur is hollowed out. A long, narrow implant, called a stem, is placed into the femur. Then, the top of the stem is fitted with a ball. The ball is placed into the socket, and the joint is tested. When the procedure is complete, the incision is closed and bandaged. You will be monitored as your anesthesia wears off. Your healthcare provider will give you instructions to help your recovery. So um, I could have saved 20 minutes to talk and just played that. Um, go to the next slide, because now I'm going to talk about a little bit between the anterior and posterior approach, because I think this is one of the most common problems in different kind of the questions I got asked by a lot of people who knew I had hip surgery. So the first thing is um, uh, naive little me, because when I practice, people virtually never had the anterior approach. So I thought, hey, this is something new. It turns out that hip, fracture, hip replacements are about 50 or 60 years old. And when they first started, they did the uh, anterior approach. They fell out of disfavor, and now they've kind of swung back. And there are few people that are not candidates if you're very obese or very muscular. Apparently, I'm not too obese, but on the other hand, I'm disappointingly uh, apparently not very uh, uh, muscular. And one of the things is you need to find a surgeon who feels comfortable with this technique and it takes about 50 to 100 surgeries to get uh, good. And so the person that I uh, went to, I knew he was doing about five anterior replacements a week. Um, the pros are, and next slide, the pros are you don't cut muscle. And because you don't cut muscle, it's generally quicker and less pain to recover. And that's not to be taken up lightly. The other thing is that They'll usually put some restrictions on activity so that you don't dislocate the joint as you heal. And there's really less restrictions using the anterior approach. And pretty much within normal in six weeks, and again, smaller incision. And this is a big one. People have had both approaches, like one uh, leg done anteriorly and one posteriorly refer the anterior. Next slide. Uh, cons are, it is more demanding you can't see as much. They cut through one of the nerves that supplies your uh, nervous sensation to your thigh, and so you can get some tingling and burning. And they did not really uh, tell me that, even though I probably should have known. And it was um, really annoying, and I wasn't sure it was gonna go away. And after a year, it's 90% back to normal, but in about 1%, it doesn't come back to normal. It's a longer surgery than the posterior approach, better, uh, greater uh, chance of bleeding. And the most important thing is a much greater chance of infection, which is probably the most common serious surgical complication. Next slide. Um, so pros to the posterior approach. Uh, a lot of people have a lot more um, uh, experience with it. It's been done a long time. If when you pound in that uh, shaft into the femur and you happen to fracture the bone, um, that's really technically very hard to repair uh, in somebody that you've done an anterior approach versus a posterior approach, and there's less uh, bleeding. And now they can do it uh, with a smaller incision. And again, not to be minimized, longer recovery time and more pain. Next slide. And again, most common infections. I'll just cover um, infection bleeding more common with the anterior approach, uh, as well as blood clots hip's location is less with the anterior approach. The limb length inequality is really funky because a lot of people experience it because they suddenly have lose that, they gain back that space that they lost. And one of the things that people tell you about is you feel like your hips are um, unequal length even when they're not after the surgery. And I used to swear that they didn't get it right for me. Uh, next one. I think what I'll do, because it's, I've got about four minutes. Do you want me to uh, finish through return to activity and, uh, or you want me to open up for questions, Vanessa? I think you can go ahead to the end. I think we're good. Okay. So one of the amazing things is when I first started to practice, people with a hip replacement were in the hospital for seven days. Then it went to three days. And really, uh, initially they were gonna do an overnight stay for me 
Uh, one of the problems for me with the overnight stay was I got a, I had an episode where I almost passed out, and I think it was a combination of the anesthesia. I hadn't drank anything. It gave me a bunch of pain medicines, and I usually don't take them. So they ended up uh, uh, keeping me an extra day. But hey, everybody said, we'll get you up. And they do get you up, and you do walk 100 yards before they will send you home, and they have you do one flight of stairs. Then you go home, and you really transition. Uh, you know, things I had to prepare for was, you know, I had my uh, bed, I had to have a, um, a pillow to put my leg on. And surprisingly, the two things that bothered me most, not pain. I, I think other than taking a Motrin or Tylenol at night, I don't know that I took any pain medicines. It was swelling. Uh, it was so swollen. And the second thing is I'm not used to sleeping on my back and I had to sleep on my back. So I felt like I never got a good night's sleep. And they gradually increase. And one of the things that was so funny, uh, they said, when will you know when I can walk without um, a cane? And they say, you'll just know. And I remember the pivotal moment. Um, uh, I had, uh, had my crutches right next to my bed in case I want to get up at night to get something to drink or go to the bathroom. And then one night, I got up to go to the bathroom. And I come back. I lie back in bed. And I go, darn, I didn't use my cane. And so it just happened uh, that way. And truly, I was back at work at, um, at around five weeks. I was a little bit careful. Hey, um, if, if Renee's, is Renee there? Because I could have come back at probably three and a half or four, but I decided not to push it. And so I waited till the five weeks and I felt pretty, pretty good. The one thing that surprised me was how tired I was and how much it, it just felt like it, even when the hip got back to sort of normal, I just had more fatigue uh, than I ever dreamed. I could drive in about three weeks. And the coolest thing was when you can suddenly take a real shower. Oh my God, that feels so good. Uh, next slide. And then restrictions are really for um, anterior. You don't really have to worry so much about these restrictions. My uh, physical therapist pretty much said, hey, the only time I've ever seen somebody uh, have a problem was uh, when they fell. And that immediately, instead of reassuring me, made me absolutely paranoid that I didn't fall. So it's very, very uh, uh, careful about tripping. And I think um, we will not have time for um, hip resurfacing. And so I'm going to cut it off here in the hopes that there, uh, uh, we can skip choosing a surgeon too. I want to do leave a little chance for questions if people have questions. And if people want to ask me about choosing a surgeon, I'm happy to uh, cover that. So Martin, I'm going to open up the question and answer function on the screen for our guests. And while people are typing in their questions, I'd like to turn it over quickly to Craig Bailey just to say two, a quick hello. I'm going to unmute him, or he can unmute himself. And then we'll come back for questions. So stay with us. All right. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Dr. Lipsky, for a great presentation. Thank you, Cameron, for making it all work. And thank you, Vanessa, for putting it all together. And thank you to everyone who uh, chimed in to listen to this. Just to let you know, Clark County Credit Union is here for your financial well-being. We've been here since 1951, and we have a great website. It is at ccculv.org. You can open your account right on our website. If you need to come into a branch, we have six full-service branches in the Valley open Monday through Friday, all with COVID-19 protocols in place. So thank you again for and we are very proud, by the way, to sponsor these health uh, neighborhood health series for Roseman. Uh, we're very, very proud to do that. And thank you again, Vanessa, and I'll turn it back over to you guys. Martin, I'm not seeing any questions. Well, either there, see, the advantage of doing it by Zoom, I can't see how many people have nodded off to sleep, uh, how many people have walked out. Uh, but hey, if there's no questions, that is fine uh, with me. Give it one more second, see if there are any last minute. I thought I saw people posting. Okay. Really I'd like to read you something. Um, in retrospect, since I had complications during surgery, during recovery, an in interprofessional team of my various providers, surgeon, PT, massage therapist, dietitian, PC, communicated with each other and my recovery 
my recovery would have improved. So I, I think I actually know who that's from. And I will have to tell you, there is nothing like a physician being ill for himself, them, him or herself, to understand the interprofessional role that everybody plays as a team. So uh, nursing, they were, uh, they were amazing. Uh, in fact, a Roseman uh, graduate cared for me and she was so helpful they can move you around the bed. Physical therapy uh, was, um, you know, I thought, oh, I know how to do this stuff. They were uh, wonderful in the hospital. Occupational therapy also uh, played a, a role. Um, the nutritionist actually did come by and talk to me a little bit about, you know, any diet issues and uh, give me a little good advice. So I can't emphasize that uh, care for people is a team sport. The other thing is um, when you go, it's helpful to go to a place that does a lot of um, joint replacements because it does become kind of a well-oiled machine where it's not just the surgeon, it's the team and the hospital and everything around it. And I can give you an example. There was a hospital much closer to where I lived. It was like two minutes away. And I happened to see my surgeon had uh, privileges there. And I knew they did a lot of orthopedic uh, procedures. And so one thing, um, uh, one thing I asked, I said, hey, could I have the surgery there? And he said, of course, if you really want it there, I'm happy to do it. However, if it's not critically important, I want to do it at this, um, uh, th you know, the hospital. I think it was uh, Alta Vista. I want to do it, or Alta View. It's Alta View. I want to do it Alta View because he said, I have a team in place. We do a lot of these and it's not just me, it's the team around me. They have the equipment I want. Um, they'll have, if I need a special uh, type of uh, prosthetic uh, hip because something's unusual, they have a lot in stock. And so I, I really encourage people to look at the, the, the team. So thanks for the interprofessional question. Martin, we have a few more. So we have a few more rolling in. Um, if there are only a few bone spurs, can they be removed without total replacement? That usually, um, if you have an isolated bone spur, like in your major athlete, yeah, they can try and shave those off. Um, certainly they'll remove bone spurs in your heel. So yes, but you know, I had so much other damage uh, that it, I mean, they would have done it. Same thing with resurfacing. Um, they could have resurfaced my uh, hip and if I was a major athlete, I might have done that. But believe it or not, it's a trickier surgery. And there's, I, I, at the time, uh, there's really only one person in the Salt Lake City area that was doing it. So um, yes, you can sometimes just remove a, uh, uh, a spur. Great, um, here's another one for you, Martin. Do people with hollow bones have higher chances of getting a disease and why? Ooh, hollow bones, um, I think, by hollow bones, you're probably referring to something called um, osteoporosis or thinning of the bones. And yes, you're more prone to fracture. Um, you're at more at risk for when they pound that little uh, shaft down into your bone of the bone fracturing or splintering or loosening of the prosthesis. So it works better with people who have um, good, healthy, strong bones. And if there's any dentist in the office, it's sort of like uh, if you have good tissue, good dumb gum tissue, and you're gonna do an implant and you try and uh, do a bone graft, the healthier everything is, the more likely it is to take. So I was, I was pretty, I was in reasonably good shape for my age. In fact, one of the other things I didn't talk about was um, I went to hip school before uh, I had the uh, surgery. And I thought, I don't need this. I know everything. I have to tell you, it was an eye opener when they started talking about walking me through everything. Uh, uh, big thing is how they wanted me to prepare my leg to reduce the risk of infection. It, it was very helpful. Now, I did feel as I looked around the room, why me? Because they were talking about trying to get people to maybe walk up to a half mile or a mile before the surgery because it'll go better. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I can, I can walk like five or 10 miles. It just hurts. And so there was a little bit, why me? I don't deserve this. Uh, but hip school was very helpful. 
That's interesting, Martin. Someone brought up the concept of prehab prior to hip replacement. So hips, it sounds like prehab and hip school. Um, this particular person talked about PT beforehand and CBD cream being very helpful prior to surgery. So, um, uh, yes, I think they're that pre part. And if you remember physical therapy, I underestimated the value of physical therapy. And I thought, I exercise, I work out, I wouldn't benefit from physical therapy. I wonder now if I might not have, because I think I would have, uh, I have very tight hamstrings and I think I could have stretched and loosened them up a little bit and gotten a little bit more mobility back. I think for people who particularly have weak joints and have been uh, inactive, they really do want you to um, do more prehab. So at hip school, they wanted me to tense my thigh 10 times and relax it uh, 10 times a day. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm on a treadmill for an hour. I don't know if I really need to do it, but I don't, I do think prehab has a role. I probably should have gone. I didn't. Hip school, which was an hour, two, like an hour, two hour course at night was very, very helpful. And you said, there's another question about hip school. You said an hour or two hours at night for how long? prior to surgery? It was, just, it was just one night, and I think um, they gave me options. There were three, they gave me three, like four nights, and I just signed up for one night. And of course it was um, Intermountain, so I got my free Intermountain water bottle. I got my free Intermountain walking stick. I, I got a lot of cool swag from it. Hey, but it was really good. They showed the, something similar to the tape I showed you. The, they talked a lot about anesthesia options and the pros and cons. Um, certainly said it's up to the anesthesiologist and the doctor, but I thought that was kind of very uh, helpful to go through. They did talk a little bit about anterior and posterior and some of the differences. Um, uh, so, and some of it were things I go, I know this, you know, they want you to have your primary care physician see you. They want your blood pressure and good control. But the things that were really about the hip, I go, yeah, this was very helpful. One last question for you, Martin. Are there any patients that are actually able to walk the day of or the day after their surgery? Absolutely. They got me up and they were going to have me walk the day of surgery. Two things why I did it. And it, I don't know if Sue Watson's there, but that's, by the way, how I found my surgeon. because she, she, Sue did very well. She was one of the people who kept, uh, every time she'd see me, say, when are you going to get that hip done? Um, and so Sue got up that same day and she said, well, you'll get up that same day. So what happened to me was I opted for spinal anesthetic, okay? It took a long time to wear out. And one of the problems with spinal anesthetic is um, it lowers your blood pressure more than general anesthesia. So you get a vasodilation. So kind of getting dizzy and your blood pressure dropping is uh, more common with spinal. The second thing is just before surgery, they gave me an Oxycontin, two Tylenols, 800 milligrams or 400 milligrams of Celebrex. They hit me with all these medications. And so they actually got me up to, to go to the bathroom. And when I was coming back to the bed, I go, uh, I, I'm feeling a little bit woozy. So they shuffled me off to uh, the, my bed and I was like ashen white, sweat was pouring out and my blood pressure was 60 over a hundred. So they decided I'm um, 60 over zero uh, and they're getting ready to call the uh, medicine person. And I said, it'll come back, it'll come back. And then because of that, they decided I could get up and go to the bathroom, but they wouldn't walk me in the hall, have me walk the halls until the next day. And I did, I walked, they won't let you go home until you can walk a um, hundred yards and go up a flight of stairs. Great. Are there any other questions anyone would like to send in? All right. Well, we are so grateful to you, Martin, and so grateful to Craig Fraley. And I know many people are very happy to see you back, Martin. And this recording, this recording will be available um, for those that like to see it again or forward it on to anyone. And I'll let you, I'll let you close, Martin. So two things. One is if you have any questions, you can email me at I saw my uh, Roseman email address because I uh, still do some uh, work with um, the College of Dental Medicine. And if you just want to email me to say hello, 
that's great too. Like to hear how the uh, my colleagues are doing. Um, I read the uh, you know the Roseman newsletter every week, so I kind of keep track and looks like people are doing great things. And uh, I'm impressed with how well everybody there seems to be um, coping with uh, uh, COVID. So I am adjunct faculty at PSU, and other than courses that have to be in person. Uh, they really have no in-person uh, uh, courses yet. And so you guys have done a great job of uh, handling a very, very difficult time. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Stay well. <laughs>